Those of you who've been with us before uh, have already heard one of the changes in our program, and that is that we have, uh, we have gone to the Italian pronunciation, to the Latin pronunciation, actually. And so uh, henceforth, we will be called Amici Medicini. I know there are a number of people in the room who have uh, not been a, an active participant in our program, uh, although I, I see at least one that I know was here when all of this started decades ago uh, under Dean Fred Robbins. But uh, over the years, the program uh, lost some of its impetus, and it was only in the last uh, decade that uh, under uh, Dr. Berger's uh, deanship, the suggestion was made to reinvigorate this program. The reinvigoration took the form of a scholarship program. Until then, it was basically focused on the general education of uh, those supporters of the university and the School of Medicine who were interested in the leading edge developments that were occurring here. Uh, but uh, at that point, we began to reach out to the community. Uh, it was driven not only by the fact that the school is not heavily endowed for scholarship, and perhaps the dean will speak about that uh, in a moment, uh, but uh, by the burden that the lack of scholarship imposes upon young medical students, whether they be of a clinical or a research orientation. Uh, and the concern that people with, with outstanding talent were being driven towards the uh, resolution of the debts that they had incurred to go to medical school rather than pursuing the careers that fit within not only their, their deep interest but their great skills. Uh, we have uh, had a bit of a pause in this program in the last couple of years, but we are now firmly reestablished. Uh, with support from uh, the new dean uh, and from the, uh, the university. And our goal is to uh, grow this program considerably. Uh, we have been providing uh, $20,000 a year scholarships to two students in each class. And if you do the math quickly on that in a four-year school, you find that we need to have at least 160 members of Amici Medicini in order to fund the responsibility uh, that this organization has undertaken. Uh, another new feature uh, to this is that we have expanded the leadership group of the program. And uh, serving with me in, in that role uh, are Beth Curtis, who's here this evening, uh, Dick Ainsworth, who I didn't see. Uh, Rob Sanders, who I did not see, Mort Epstein, who's sitting over here uh, on the aisle, Sally Griswold, who could not be with us this evening, uh, Vic Gelb, who is out of the city, uh, Dr. Dick Fradian, who is here, uh, and Carl Dorschek, Dr. Carl Dorschek, who also uh, is here with us, and Bennett Yanowitz, who is here. Uh, it's our belief that with the energy of these people and the support of you and others like you who understand the importance of scholarship uh, funding that we can grow this program. Uh, I'll come back and give you one more commercial before we go home. But uh, I really want to get into the program now. Uh, you know that uh, in September of last year, uh, Pam Davis was named as the dean of the School of Medicine. She'd served for a year prior to that time in the role of uh, interim dean. Um, it was a good learning experience, I suspect. There was a learning experience. I want good, maybe I'll leave the good off. <laughs> uh, it was a... Even in midlife, you can learn new things. There you go. Uh, if, if I were to tell you all the things that are worth knowing about Pam Davis, we would never get to hear from her or our two speakers this evening, and so I'm not going to do that. Uh, her record, uh, but from the fact that she went to Duke uh, for her uh, graduate degrees <laughs> and her MD, uh, here has been outstanding. The work that she's done in cystic fibrosis, 
the chairs and, and the programs that she heads here at the School of Medicine, uh, we can be very, very proud of having an uh, individual of such great accomplishment. And, uh, and I can tell you from uh, firsthand experience uh, in the year that she has had the uh, full responsibility, a person who has a very deep commitment to the success of our School of Medicine. I think uh, the Amici program has always been a, a highlight of the medical, in the medical school's firmament and we're, uh, we're delighted to see it uh, reviving under the expanded leadership. I've been at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine on the faculty for 27 years and one of the great hushes, the hush comes over, over the room when you're invited to speak to the Amici. So it, it really is a, an important program and one which we really would really like to keep up good communication. Um, I have been here for, uh, for 27 years and I can tell you that the school has never been better positioned for progress. Over the last five years we've built a research infrastructure that, that uh, the university really never concentrated on before. Over the last five years, we've recruited dynamic new faculty and uh, we have new achievements uh, in the research lab and coming out of the research lab and I think you may be reading about them in the newspaper uh, in, uh, in the days to come. You may have already seen, for example, that one of our faculty members in, who's a, an in-depth mechanistic cancer researcher has now produced a test for colon cancer that uh, might avoid the current test that you have to have to detect colon cancer by simply taking a little bit of stool and doing an analysis on it. And this may, uh, this may not only uh, allow you to, uh, to uh, scan for colon cancer in between those unpleasant procedures. I have to be careful because our speaker does those unpleasant <laughs> procedures. But, um, but also uh, to, uh, you know, to get a jump on the, on the tumor at its very earliest stages. We have uh, a new inve an investigator now, Dr. Markowitz has been here for, for a long time. We have a brand new or a, a two-year investigator who studies the retina and can make blind mice see. We have really fabulous uh, programs here in research, but, I can, but what we really do in a medical school is we educate students. And uh, we're, be we're very well positioned now for that because in the, the summer of 2006, we rolled out the Western Reserve II curriculum, which was a substantial revision of the, of the famous Case Western Reserve curriculum that was initiated in the early 1950s and that really put this school on the map. We retained, I think, the essential features of the Western Reserve curriculum, which were the organ-based education program uh, so that you study the cardiovascular system. You don't study pharmacology and biochemistry, you study the cardiovascular system and all the physiology and biochemistry that's related to it. We retained that. We retained the early introduction of clinical experiences so that in very early in the course of your medical school you were anchored in the primacy of the doctor-patient relationship. And we retained the uh, approach to the student as colleague rather than the hierarchical approach. To that we have added some new threads. We have added a unit on patient and population health sciences so that the student comes to understand that his relationship with his patient needs to be seen in the context of the broader society and that what he does in that office has implications beyond that single patient. That's very, very important. It also gives a window into public health and into international health, which are becoming exceedingly uh, vital in, the, in, the, in today's global village. We also added threads of leadership and civic professionalism. In some ways, the profession needs to take back the night from the insurance companies and the government that, uh, that has, uh, has encroached on the, the fundamental practice of medicine, and we need leaders who can do that. And critically important for someone like me, we have added a thread of scholarship so that every single student who uh, goes through now will produce a thesis and through his, his or her career will uh, develop an appreciation for how research is conducted and what you need to know about the research in order to decide whether it's worth incorporating it into your clinical practice. Doctors do not 
cease their education after the four years of medical school or the four years of medical school plus their education. The world is, the information explosion has hit medicine in spades, but not everything you read on the internet or everything you read in a medical journal is, is gospel. So how do you decide what of this vast array of information you want to incorporate into your life, into your, into your medical life? How do you decide how you should change your practice? How do you evaluate this? And how do you use the framework that we're trying to give you in, in medical school to um, to be, become a lifelong learner. Our new approach in the Western Reserve II curriculum is to place much of the responsibility for learning on the student. We do still have some lectures and we do have expert facilitated small groups, but a lot of our learning is done in what are called IQ groups or inquiry groups where the students themselves take responsibility for teaching one another. You guys know that you never, you never learn something so well as when you have to teach it. So this is a, a, a strategy, a deliberate strategy for improving the adult learning. Now I can tell you, I, can, I can't give you the full statistics because we don't have them, but our first class that's finished the preclinical portion of uh, the Western Reserve II curriculum, it started in 2006 and is now heading into the clinical years, we have board scores back on about 70 of them, 7-0. Not everyone took the boards at the first opportunity and we don't have scores back on every, everyone. Of those 70 students, now there are, there are three digit scores and two digit scores, and two digit scores, obviously the highest you can go is 99, right? So of those 70 students, 53 have a 99. So we think it's working. We think the new curriculum is working. Now, you know, it may be, we, we gotta worry about the rest of them coming through, you know, there are gonna be more scores out. But boy, that's one heck of a start. And we're very proud of these students. We have an extraordinary group of students and an extraordinary group of applicants. When Western Reserve II was beginning, that, that the class had enrolled in 2006, I thought, geez, we advertise we're gonna have a thesis. We're gonna scare them away. They're gonna be running for the hills and we're not gonna get any applicants. In fact, our applicant pool went up 49% when nationally it went up 5%. For the class that started in 2007, it went up another 11% when nationally it was 5%. We have students here who are hungry to take responsibility for their own medical education and become the very best doctors that they can. The class had entered in 2007, 43 of them had published a scientific paper before they walked in the door. And I bet that a few of those papers wound up being published after they walked in the door too, so I bet it's actually more than that. This is an extraordinary group of people, but it's not only the, the depth of science. Uh, we had to track one scholarship recipient down in Shanghai where he was teaching in Chinese. Uh, we had one student come to us from Juilliard where he spent two years deciding whether he wanted to be a professional concert pianist or whether he wanted to, uh, to be a doctor. So he's decided since he accompanied so many singers, he's gonna be an ENT specialist and deal with the throat problems of singers. Uh, we, uh, they're, they're just an, we have one student who was a Fulbright and a religion major who comes to me regularly to talk about the responsibility for our, our technology transfer products and how we should make sure that they are available to the third world and is active in the student medical association group that, uh, uh, that uh, is uh, pushing that point of view. These are extraordinary students. But we don't get all of the extraordinary students we would like or who would want to come here. We can accept them, but sometimes they can't accept us. Some of the issue really is the dollars that it costs to go to medical school. It's an, it, it really is a huge debt burden. 70% um, of our class graduates with more than $100,000 uh, in debt. That's kind of staggering. It's like having a mortgage, but not having a house to show for it. And uh, we, have, we have not been, been competitive in our scholarship aid. We share data with a 13 school consortium, admittedly a very high class consortium, Washington University, Johns Hopkins, Yale, the University of Rochester. Among that 13 school consortium, we are 12th for scholarship aid and to the total amount of scholarship aid we can offer. So sometimes a student has to decide based on more than just his or her desire to come to uh, Case Western Reserve, 
we'd like to take that off the table for as many students as we possibly can. So your commitment to coming here and talking with us and being with us and hearing from our, both from our students and from some of our superb faculty, I really appreciate uh, your commitment and uh, the opportunity to convince you that this is a really fine cause and this is an, one of the most important priorities in the, in the entire School of Medicine. It's what we're about, it's what our product is. We have some of our alums in the audience. I, I may not be a real alum, but they made me an honorary alumna last year at, uh, at uh, the, uh, the reunion, so I do have to at least put that in. It's a great place to, uh, to have trained and a great place to, uh, to under, to, in which to uh, understand the context of medicine in the larger world. Thank you, Pam. Um, I'm not going to speak for long, but, but I uh, suspect that you, those of you who haven't had the opportunity to hear from her uh, before, uh, will understand why we're so enthusiastic about her leadership. Uh, we, we are blessed and I have no doubt that uh, we're going to reap the rewards for, uh, for that decision. Uh, the Dean mentioned several of, of the students, uh, of our scholarship students, and we have a few of them here this evening. One of the things that we do is invite uh, periodically a student to speak and you will have that opportunity to uh, to hear someone in in just a moment or two but I know that from the class of 2008 uh, Matthew Papa is sitting back here uh, and uh, from the class of 2009 um, I don't think Ovidio uh, there <laughs> Laura is here though and uh, if Although the dean didn't mention it, I suspect that the uh, the student of divinity that she was talking about was Laura. Laura was in our first class of scholars, Laura Sponseller, and uh, took a leave after two years to uh, go to divinity school, and she did okay. Uh, <laughs> and she's now back, and this year I believe will complete her uh, her program here at Case. So it's a treat to see you. Before she came to school, just to add a, I'm sorry, I I have to waste take a little of your time. Laura taught English in Japan for several years. So the students that we're getting are not just smart people; they're people who have dimension to their life and they will be important contributors to the society in which they uh, reside. Our hope is that through the relationship that we'll build through our scholarship program, that many of them will elect to stay in Cleveland and enrich our community. But it's nice to see you, Laura. Um, and I believe Christine uh, Schenko is sitting in the back room. Christine is in the class of 2009. I don't think Anyone from the class of 2010 is here? Am I am I wrong? Okay. Uh, 